structure, this workshop looks at specific issues relating to participation. Access for all can only be achieved when the internet is made fully available to everyone regardless of the systems they use. The next billion are not only consumers but should also be creators and participants. Enabling this are fair use, open source and ITC standards. We will begin with brief presentations by the speakers and then move into a question and answer session. It's a pleasure um, to, to be here. This is the third um, Internet Governance Forum that WIPO has, has, has attended and participated in. And uh, I personally um, was in Rio and was very pleased to participate in a panel on this topic or a similar topic. And so it was very honored to be asked to represent my organization and to talk a little about what we're doing on, in these important areas. Uh, here in Hyderabad. Um, my specific area is really copyright to open standards, so I thought it would be interesting in, in starting off, because I think the other panelists will definitely be more advocates for specific approaches. Um, if I were just to, to talk about really how we're moving um, from a process point of view at WIPO, we, we definitely view knowledge as a public good in um, the intellectual property system. The uh, Treaties that WIPO administers, uh, more than 20, are intended to provide both reward for in innovation and creativity and incentive for further innovation and creativity. And it's no uh, uh, surprise that um, building the infrastructure for uh, protection and management of these rights, patents, trademarks, and copyrights, um, has come under a lot of uh, pressure and uh, there's a lot of stress in the system, particularly vis-a-vis -vis the internet and the, the marvelous possibilities for ubiquity of communication, for collaborative creativity, for um, new forms of sharing and use of, of information that these technologies made possible. Uh, and then on the other side, uh, a system for protection of intellectual property that began really in, uh, in Venice in the 16th century. but more uh, to the point in terms of the structures that exist today in the late 19th century when the Paris Convention for the Protection of Industrial Property, uh, the Berne Convention for the Protection of Literary and Artistic Property um, came into being and really started the international multilateral intellectual property system that we have, have now. Um, fair use, turning now to, to fair use, fair use is a specific limitation on rights in the, the copyright law of the United States of America. Um, it uh, is a, an umbrella concept in a way because it's very flexible and, and applies four factors to determine circumstances under which uh, content can be used by, uh, by anyone really uh, without the permission of, of the rights owner, of the creator or the, or the owner of rights. And these have to do with the effect of the use on, on the, the uh, market or any potential market for the work, the public interest involved, uh, the amount of the, the work that's used, et cetera. And it's um, uh, been applied and implemented in ways, starting in the U.S., that very much relate to use of technology and to, to use of protected copyright content for purposes such as reverse engineering and um, for creating competing uh, computer programs, uh, as well as more traditional uh, uses such as parody and criticism uh, and review. Um, um, the creation of some adaptations and translations under specific circumstances, as well as uh, use for educational purposes, use by teachers in classrooms. The so-called fair use guidelines developed in the 1970s were specifically intended to apply the general four fair use uh, criteria to a very specific need for access to knowledge, to content, for a very specific public interest purpose, i.e. public uh, educational activities. What, what's happening now is that this concept um, that began in the U.S. Is, is, and it's similar but not identical to fair dealing, which exists in the laws of a number of common law countries. Where, but fair dealing is a more restrictive approach. But fair use in the sort of larger uh, sense, in the vernacular sense, uh, the way uh, as it was originally written in, in the copyright law of the U.S., is now applied much more broadly to mean a set of general free use privileges that should be applied or arguably should be applied, particularly in relation to uh, deployment of technology to access content without the complication, it is argued, or without the, the restraints of traditional copyright law. 
And in that respect, we, we see fair use arguments being put forward in respect of development of open standards, of, of use of open source uh, software and others, um, which are not strictly speaking accurate from a copyright point of view, but that doesn't really matter. What is the point is, is that there are needs that are being expressed, expectations on the part of beneficiary groups, visually impaired persons, for example, um, libraries and archives whose activities have been absolutely revolutionized by the internet and the possibilities for preservation uh, as well as dissemination of, of their collections in digital form, the, either digitized or, or born digital. And the argument is that the existing system of copyright limitations um, in national laws, uh, which are permitted in the international treaties but not specified in the international treaties, in other words, left to, to, to countries themselves, to governments, to, to develop the specific scope of exceptions, are not sufficient to provide access to knowledge to those who need it in um, specific uh, contexts, in specific uh, use settings. And so for this reason, uh, four years ago at WIPO, the government of Chile put forward a proposal to develop uh, minimum standards of, interna of uh, minimum international standards of limitations and exceptions in three areas uh, for visually impaired persons, for uh, use by educational institutions and, for, and in educational settings, and for the activities of libraries and archives. And without going into more detail, because I don't want to use much more time, um, this process is now uh, ongoing. Uh, we are uh, examining the possible uh, a draft treaty that has been put forward on uh, limitations and exceptions for the benefit of visually impaired persons. And uh, the international normative context in which this is taking place is now very real, and it's also very uh, unprecedented because treaty making in the copyright area has never uh, undertaken simply to look at the possible creation of limitations on rights without parallel creation of the whole infrastructure, that is to say the rights themselves, coupled with limitations and exceptions. So this is a sui generis exercise and one that offers a lot of promise and challenge to all stakeholders involved. Turning now briefly to, to open source uh, software, this is uh, an issue that is um, both a copyright issue and a patent issue in terms of intellectual property because open source licenses are based on copyright. They are exercise, uh, an exercise or a way of exercising the rights of the authors under copyright law, but they are done so in a way that allows liberal uh, use and uh, reuse and redistribution and adaptation privileges by uh, second comer computer programs, who, pre computer programmers who use code that is licensed under one of the more than 70 open source licenses, for example, the GNU GPL, um, that allows them to liberally um, take and incorporate existing code in their programs and create new code and distribute, in many cases, requiring them to distribute that code under the same liberal principles. Um, open source is a patent issue as well because increasingly <coughs> software is subject to patents. This is extremely controversial worldwide. Some countries uh, confer patent protection per se on computer programs. A number of other countries uh, grant patents on inventions that include uh, computer program functionality without conferring protection per se on the computer programs. But this nexus between patent protection of software where it exists and open source uh, licensing of code under copyright is an area of, of, of ferment that is extremely challenging but also presents many opportunities because what we are seeing in the marketplace is enormously an increasing combination of proprietary, commercial, and open source code in the same products or services. So an issue then becomes how do you know and manage rights, manage expectations, manage not access to the knowledge embodied in the computer code when a number of different um, intellectual property rights potentially apply to them, uh, de facto, without intention, because sometimes the code that is used and incorporated by a programmer uh, under an open source license uh, in, in a new computer program, uh, the owner of rights in that program does not know that the code is thus incorporated. So there's some issues of, of uh, knowing about what, what, you're, what you're developing, and this is very important from a governance standpoint as well. Open standards, just very briefly, I know this is the main subject for many of our other speakers, so I'm, I'm just going to say that uh, in our Standing Committee on Patents, the SCP, which is our main body, member state body that uh, deals with patent issues. Last June in their meeting they considered a, uh, a large report on uh, patent uh, issues um, that was produced by WIPO that uh, 
raises and explains a number of the issues related to standards setting, intellectual property and standards. Um, standards development generally, not specifically open standards, although the issue of open standards is very much covered. And what's going to happen now is that a, a study will be commissioned on intellectual property and standards that looks at many of the issues and many of the concerns concerning the use of or inclusion of, of uh, patented technology or uh, uh, intellectual property protected technology in standard settings processes, whether that's appropriate, the extent to which it's appropriate, the extent to which issues like uh, disclosure of the uh, technology of intellectual property rights in any technology that is involved in a, in, in a standard setting process must be required. Uh, the, the issue of pricing, what sort of royalties are appropriate, and, uh, and, and, and also the circumstances when it might be appropriate that no intellectual property rights be, be, um, be uh, available or asserted in respect of, of, of standards, and, uh, and if not, then uh, even if intellectual property rights are present, in the standard that the standard would, there would be no royalties charged, so royalty free under principles called RAND, FRAND, royalty free, et cetera. So WIPO is now centrally moving into the deep examination of many of the issues concerning access to knowledge in relation to technology, in relation to uh, existing intellectual property rights and how we may craft them in a way, copyright and patent in particular, that more needs, uh, that meets uh, adequately and, and sufficiently the, the needs of a variety of stakeholders. Uh, and so with that, I think I will stop. And once again, thank you very much for the opportunity to participate. Thank you very much, Richard. Um, we will be taking questions at the end of the session, so please make note of any questions you have, and we'll come back to them after all the speakers have made their presentations. Next, we will be hearing from Laura Denardis, who is the Executive Director of the Information Society Project at Yale University. Thanks, Malini, and good afternoon, everyone. I am with the Yale Information Society Project, which is an intellectual center at Yale Law School that studies the implications of the internet and new information technologies on law and society, guided by certain values such as democracy and social justice. And uh, I'm also an internet governance scholar who specializes in technical standardization. So I am very delighted to be on this panel and here at the IGF, and I want to thank the organizers of this panel for inviting me. And it just seems like yesterday that we were in Rio. It's um, really amazing. Um, I would like to discuss the link between open standards and the global flow of knowledge. The premise of this workshop in general is that knowledge is a public good. And the premise of my brief remarks is that open technical standards, though often invisible to the public and probably more invisible than any other technology, uh, that, that these standards are intrinsically linked to the global public good. In particular, I would like to discuss three global knowledge implications of open standards. There are many things that could be discussed, but I would like to focus on the following three. First, the issue of open standards and distributive justice. I think this is an issue that is not um, addressed enough, uh, particularly how standards can create scarce resources that are necessary for meaningful participation in the information society. So I'd like to discuss that. Second, the issue of open standards and political freedoms, both political participation, but also individual civil liberties. And the third area I'd like to mention briefly is open standards and the issue of development. What do uh, we even mean by information and communication technology standards? I think it's really important to um, always emphasize that standards are not software. They're not material products like software or hardware. They exist at a much more abstract and deeper level of, um, of control and abstraction. They're hidden in many ways, but they are literally the blueprints that companies can use to develop technologies that are interoperable with other technologies that are based on these standards. And uh, most of us in this room um, know a lot about standards, um, both as people who study internet governance and policy makers, but also as users. So we're all using Wi-Fi. Many of us use Bluetooth. Uh, we, we know about standards such as MP3, um, HTTP, et cetera. Um, these are just a few examples of I don't know, probably thousands 
of information and communication standards that enable the production, the exchange, and the use of information. So from a technological standpoint, they're incredibly important because they are the agreed upon rules that do a number of things. They structure information in common formats, and they establish communication interfaces that enable interoperability between very diverse information and communication technology environments. And I don't need to tell this group that they're also very important from an economic standpoint because they carry significant economic externalities such as enabling competition among various vendors, such as enabling innovation in product areas based on these common standards. But the premise of my remarks today is that technical standards are not only technical design decisions that carry these significant economic externalities, but they also make political decisions about global knowledge policy. So they are a unique form of pub public policy. So these open technical resources are necessary for information production and exchange. And uh, really, I would call them, uh, as many people do, knowledge embedded tools. They're tools that have knowledge embedded in them, similar to enabling technologies for developing things such as medical and agricultural resources. So technical standardization is a key internet governance function, which is why it's discussed um, in many different uh, fora here at the Internet Governance Forum. And as I mentioned, a function that is critical because of enabling technical interoperability, because of enab enabling economic competition and innovation, but also because of political implications. And uh, I mentioned that I would discuss three briefly. So the first area is the area of standards and distributive justice. Many technical standards create scarce resources finite resources that are required for access to information networks. So how these resources are developed and distributed and by whom are very important internet governance issues. Some standards, uh, just to, to give a few examples of these, some uh, more obvious ones that create finite resources are things such as um, standards that allocate radio frequency spectrum among users, such as broadcast standards, Wi-Fi, cellular standards. Others prioritize the flow of information over a network based on the type of application that's being transmitted, such as prioritizing voice applications and um, doing things such as decelerating peer-to-peer -peer video. Other standards divide up orbital slots in satellites. Some assign rights of access to local brand broadband services. Uh, some provide um, asymmetric distribution of bandwidth where there's a certain speed downstream and upstream. So there are many examples of these. I would say probably the, the best example is um, IP, the Internet Protocol. It's an example of how standards create finite resources necessary for access to information networks. Now IP, not intellectual property, but Internet Protocol, is the central protocol of the internet as most in internet engineers would describe it. And IP addresses are technically a scarce resource because every device exchange of information over the internet requires the possession of this unique number, an IP address, that identifies the virtual address of the device similar to how a unique postal address would identify a home's unique physical location. Not a perfect analogy, but a little analogy. So um, as will be discussed on Friday and throughout this conference, we know that the long prevailing internet standard IPv4, which originated back in the 1980s, in the early 1980s, uh, specifies a unique 32-bit number for this internet address, and that this address length of 32 bits provides approximately 4.3 billion unique addresses. We also know that the newer standard, IPv6, expands the address length to 128 bits and therefore supplies, well, it would be 2 to the 128th power, which we don't really have a great vocabulary to describe other than calling it 340 undecillion addresses. So this is an interesting story about the scarce resources that are developed and um, changes to standardization that ensue when there are some constraints on resources. And it will be interesting to hear about the transition on Friday, especially since the upgrade to IPv6 has not happened to as great an extent as has been expected. But all of these examples show that standards can create finite resources that are necessary 
for participation in the global knowledge economy. Um, the issue of how these standards are set and how they're distributed certainly raise issues of distributive justice, and how the standards are adopted or not adopted is also an important question. So in a global knowledge economy, control over standards and the scarce resources that they create increasingly determines access and also wealth. The second issue I'd like to emphasize in the link between um, the public, public good of knowledge and standards is um, the issue of uh, more direct political implications. Standards can have very direct political implications, such as making policy decisions related to individual civil liberties or affecting the ability of citizens to engage in democratic processes. Just to briefly give um, an example of each of these two areas, um, cer certainly decisions made in internet standards governance present either an opportunity to advance what I would call the libertari libertarian ideals of freedom and openness that have been architected into the internet's underlying protocols, or decisions made in standards can be a threat that these values will dissipate if protocols are increasingly used to restrict a access or to regulate speech, to implement censorship, or impose excessive copyright restrictions online. So even though internet protocol and IP addresses um, uh, just to continue this example, I'm, I'm going to, 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 to cite IP a little bit in this talk. Um, they have really become the central front in several civil liberties issues, just to use an example. We know that um, they're, they're at the central front right now of intellectual property protection, such as copyright filtering and um, electronic government surveillance and censorship in certain areas and also privacy. And this is all in the way that the protocols are being used, including the growing sophistication of deep packet inspection. So, um, so this, is, this is an issue where standards sometimes raise um, privacy, censorship, and other civil liberties issues. We certainly see that in encryption standards and other kinds of protocols for the internet. So it's, a, it's um, always a balance between the need for national security and law enforcement on one hand and the need for uh, privacy and other civil liberties on the other hand, the need for uh, protecting innovation and allowing intellectual property on one hand, and the, um, the need, to d depending on one's perspective, of not having excessive copyright restrictions for things such as digital education. So protocols are often the place where this balance occurs and where this tension occurs. There are also other political implications. Um, I'll, just use, I'll just give one other example. The archiving of government documents and public documents is a fundamental responsibility of democratic governments, and public access to these documents is very essential for government accountability and for deliberation over the efficacy of government institutions and policies. So uh, just keeping in the theme of open standards, using a proprieta proprietary standard is usually thought to not meet this obligation of government documents because it can lock public documents into a proprietary format that can require citizens to use a certain so type of software, can raise concerns about backwards incompatibility and, um, and other concerns. So in these cases in which standards have either civil liberties or, or political implications, the questions, again, of who sets the standards and how they are set, is um, these questions are highly relevant because standards are a form of public policy, not necessarily established by government, but established by private institutions. So the more open a standards development process, the greater the legitimacy to be making these public interest decisions, um, openness such as participatory openness in the development, transparency in procedures, and public document availability of the standard. And then finally, I would say that standards are also an issue of economic development. There really has been a lot of discussion in the internet governance uh, fora over these last three years about internet standards as a basic requirement for the diffusion of information and communication technologies in the developing world as well as in the developed world. As key internet standards have expanded to include standards for not just text but audio, video, and images, and new devices and applications, 
um, have, have uh, come about over these many years, we sometimes see, we actually see that ICT standards can be impediments to development. So this is something that I have, uh, have studied extensively. Sometimes interoperability is not a given with standards, and there is, can be a lack of interoperability. Sometimes the underlying intellectual property arrangements of standards um, cannot, they, they may not necessarily reflect the political and economic interests of developing countries. They may not necessarily enable the maximum competition based on these standards, such as has been historically the case with internet standards. And they may not necessarily be um, as open as we have seen in the traditions of internet standard setting. So these are important things to look at. The, um, you know, in my opinion, the internet's protocols have historically been openly available for use and um, this characteristic has contributed to the internet's growth and innovation. So um, I know that I'm almost out of time, but I just wanted to raise these three issues as a way to start the discussion. Um, the issue of standards and distributive justice, the issue of standards and political freedoms, including civil liberties and participation in political processes, and the issue of open standards in development. So, um, I hope that um, this will just be the beginning of the conversation, and thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Laura, for highlighting the, the link between open standards and access to knowledge, and also raising several important points regarding their relevance for economic and political um, uh, development. Next, we have Rishabh Ghosh, uh, who's a senior researcher at the UN University Merit in Maastricht, the Netherlands. Good afternoon. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about open source as a global public good, as a system of participation in the information society, and as a way of uh, improving digital inclusion, not just to access, not just treating the next billion as uh, consumers of the internet, but treating them as producers and active, treating them as producers and active participants in content. In, there was a story in the BBC two years ago from Ghana where Frank Darko, a mechanic in a city outside um, Kimasi in Ghana, said he could build any car out of spare parts. And even a Mercedes, it would take him three weeks as long as he had the engine. He could build the body out of anything. He was one of 80,000 mechanics who worked in an area next to Kimasi in Ghana. And they all worked on spare parts. They are all known as traitors. They take broken down cars, which might be 40 years old, and fix them. So they're artisans, and uh, they can make anything. It might not be as efficient in terms of uh, the use of time or the use of capital, but labor in Ghana is cheap. So it is an efficient way of reusing what is available. It's also a pretty green way of making cars. Um, we're not strangers to that sort of approach to mechanics in India where cars run for a long, long time and the ambassador is a popular car because you can basically fix it with rubber bands in any village mechanic knows how to do that. Um, but imagine if people could not take cars apart and look at them they would not be able to develop these skills to do this. Frank Darko never went to engineering school. He didn't formally study how to fix cars, let alone create them. He certainly didn't study how to make cars out of spare parts because I don't think people really teach that. He just figured it out for himself and worked as an apprentice with someone else working on spare parts. It's an industry based on need based on the availability of resources and the availability of needs and the matching of resources to needs where you have spare parts because you have old cars but the cars are all broken down. At the same time you have people who need cars but can't pay for new cars or want to extend the lifetime of their cars. And what you have in a free market, you should have an ability to match any need with any resource. And what you often don't have in the world of software uh, 
and uh, intellectual creation in general, is you have, in principle, a, pre -mar a free market where you have knowledge that is available and flowing around the world, and you have brains all over the world. The next billion users of the internet are a billion new brains who can collaborate and work together to create new things and new ideas. But the restrictions on what employers recognize. In uh, 2006, we conducted a series of follow-on surveys in uh, focusing mostly in outside Europe and America. We conducted them in South Africa, Brazil, Argentina, Malaysia, India, and found fairly similar results. Again, developers said that their most important reason to participate in these communities was learning skills. Even more so this time, they said that these skills lead to jobs and that these jobs um, uh, do not discriminate, uh, in, in many ways do not discriminate between open source experience and a degree. Um, about 80% of respondents in Europe and 60 to 70% in developing countries said that um, having uh, open source, provable open source experience um, would compensate for the lack of a degree in getting a job. And we found fairly similar results again from employers, although this differed a lot from country to country. In Japan, for instance, a degree is still extremely important, but in India, um, which was a bit surprising perhaps, degrees were much less important than open source experience, which could compensate. Um, so that, that I think is hard evidence for the fact that technologies which are accessible to people participating rather than only using can create skills that is translatable into economic growth at the local level. So I'd like to end by uh, quoting, um, um, I was on a panel at, uh, I think it was an UNCTAD conference in Geneva five years ago, and sitting with me was Congressman Villanova Nunes from Peru, who'd uh, recently been, at that time, been in a famous fight um, with uh, proprietary software vendors leading all the way to uh, pretty much a summons uh, by the ambassador of the US to the president of Peru saying that you cannot have any preferences for open source software. And Congressman Nunes was asked by a delegate from a certain country in the room that isn't it a good idea for developing countries who do not have skills to use black box software that just works? Because at least you can use it. And uh, he said, um, much as perhaps Frank Darko might have said about cars in Ghana, he said that we could use black box software, and it is true we do not have all the skills, but if we do use black box software, we'll never, never develop the skills. And if we use open source software, then at least we're not just users, we can also contribute back, and we can learn those skills and build our economies further. Thank you. Following Rishabh's thought-provoking thought, uh, talk about the merits of open participation in the internet and knowledge economy, we have Thiru Bala Subramaniam, who is Geneva representative of Knowledge Ecology International. Thank you, Malini. Um, can, any, can everyone hear me? Yeah. Okay. Um, well, as a lot of you might know, um, this July in Geneva, Switzerland, there was a failed uh, WTO uh, mini ministerial summit. Well, amidst the tumult engendered by the collapse of that uh, mini ministerial, one would not be faulted for holding the view that no silver lining could emerge from its gloomy aftermath. However, the policy vacuum that followed the failure of the July talks provides the perfect opportunity for new paradigms to be tested within the existing architecture of of the WTO. Specifically, KI env envisions a modest proposal for a trade framework and a multilateral agreement that would involve negotiations and binding commitments to support the creation of and access to certain public goods. In particular, the provision of global public goods 
involving knowledge would be enhanced by the creation of an agreement within the WTO that would feature binding commitments by governments to undertake actions to increase the supply of a heterogeneous class of public goods operating in a fashion analogous to binding commitments to reduce tariffs and subsidies or to liberalize trade and services. Now, economists uh, characterize uh, global public goods or public goods rather as non-rivalrous and not excludable in consumption. According to the International Task Force that's uh, on global public goods, which was a Franco-Swedish initiative, global public goods are goods that address issues that are deemed to be important to the international community and cannot or will not be adequately addressed by individual countries acting alone and therefore must be addressed collectively on a multilateral basis by both developed and developing countries. Um, examples of global public goods include uh, international economic stability, security, the environment, regulations for civil aviation and telecommunications, humanitarian assistance, and knowledge. The focus of our proposal is for a mechanism to address the undersupply of knowledge as a public good. There are many reasons for the undersupply of uh, global public goods, including issues of sovereignty, uh, differing uh, preferences and priorities of WTO members, and the free rider problem. For public goods involving knowledge, the private sector's role is growing, but these efforts are insufficient to address many problems, and actions by governments alone by governments, rather, are necessary. Governments have a greater incentive to increase the welfare and consumption of their citizens than to the entire world, so therefore you have a chronic supply of global public goods. Now, this is actually taken from the uh, website of the WTO. Above all, the WTO is a negotiating forum, but what's interesting about this slide is that what they emphasize that what we emphasize is that it's not just about liberalizing trade. And in some circumstances, its rules support maintaining trade barriers, for example, to protect consumers or prevent the spread of disease. Although negotiated and signed by governments, the goal is to help producers of goods and services, exporters and importers, conduct their businesses while allowing governments to meet their social and environmental objectives. The WTO has defined trade liberalization as a global public good that was undersupplied because of both the free rider problem and the dynamics of the, the prisoner's dilemma, whereby members have private incentives to pursue policies that collectively leave everyone worse off. The solution, therefore, is for the WTO is to create a mechanism for countries to negotiate for and aggregate binding commitments to liberalize trade so that the collective benefits were large and the costs of being excluded from such negotiations was so prohibitive that this dilemma would be overcome. Now, the WTO is not just about trade liberalization. As we can see, the WTO TRIPS agreement requires restrictions on the free movement of goods with embedded deliberate inefficiencies for example, for the use of compulsory licensing uh, for patents. Uh, TRIPS is an exercise in global norm setting that is largely about the promotion and enclosure and privatization of knowledge through a mandatory set of intellectual property rights. <laughs> a WTO an agreement on global public goods would focus on voluntary but binding commitments to enhance the supply of heterogeneous uh, global public goods. In a way, it would be modeled on the GATS. For example, a country would uh, not have to make any offer. Allowing countries to aggregate willingness to pay for or su supply certain goods when it is dependent upon matching offers by a third party. Um, an example could be, for example, if the Africa group would insist that they would not agree to a general consensus on a broader WTO trade agenda unless there was a collectively adequate 
offer to supply open source uh, research on malaria or other neglected diseases of particular concern to the African region. Um, I'm not going to go through all of this, but these are some uh, potential asks or offers that could be envisioned by such an agreement. Um, some of the things probably on the right-hand side of the column would be of interest to people at the Internet Governance Forum. Now, of course, for there are issues to be considered by this uh, proposal in terms of what would qualify. Uh, you know, that could be broken down by standardized offers or um, uh, sui generis offers. And, you know, what, then there's a question of what could go wrong. Some um, observers have said that developing countries could see this as uh, knowledge mining or others see it as a way of uh, using it as a bargaining chip. These are future things that uh, uh, we think um, would constitute a broader research agenda. There seems to be a numeric problem there with Arabic numerals. Um, in future steps would be the exploration of the type of projects that might be appropriate, including an analysis of intellectual property issues, uh, procedures for both the sui generis and standardized offers, um, examining the relationship between trade liberalization and global public goods, and uh, possible extensions of this instrument uh, to include humanitarian assistance, environment, or technology transfers to developing countries, and an analysis of the risks and tools to manage the risks of the negative outcomes. Conclusions are that global public knowledge goods are chronically undersupplied, and this would not change without a global mechanism to address the free rider and prisoner's dilemma. The WTO has strong enforcement measures and useful models for inducing voluntary but binding offers. There's no reason why the, the WTO should only be used to promote trade and not the consumption of public goods. And then it's a question of uh, fora. If not the WTO, then how and where? Thank you very much. <coughs> Thank you, Thiru, for your In a place called Clip Town. And they developed the Freedom Charter, which is seen as, um, in 1955, which was seen as a, the vision for a better South Africa. And when it came to culture, they had this to say, all the cultural treasures of mankind shall be open to all by the free exchange of books, ideas, and contact with other lands. Um, and um, I think the Freedom Charter is very important because it inspired a lot of the South African Constitution. But from a, a technocrat's perspective, I belong to the Government IT Officers Council. That's the chief information officers of every national department. Uh, we have a forum where we come together and, um, well, some people criticize us as a talk shop, but we actually come together and discuss strategies and policies for government. And we came together in 2001. We formed a open source working group, which I'm now the chair of. And we were tasked to come up with a strategy. You know, what should the South African government's response to this phenomenon of open source and open standards be? Um, should we ban it from our networks? Or is there some value, is there some ben benefit for government? And should we be looking at um, exploiting that benefit. We went away and we came back with a strategy document which was then adopted as a policy document in 2003. Um, we came up with a whole list of benefits and uh, I think the lo a lot of the arguments have been made. But uh, what's important for me is, you know, it's not just the product that's important, but as was discussed here, it's the process that's important as well as the the collaborative nature of open source. And in the end, I think for government and for citizens, there's more competition, there's innovation, and more value. What happened then is that in 2007, we were asked by our cabinet what progress we were making in terms of implementing our open source policy. 
And we went back to them and said, we haven't done very well. There are a number of factors working against us. Uh, there's a whole ecosystem. Uh, we need a much more aggressive policy around free and open source software. But by then, things had moved quite uh, considerably. And we weren't only talking about open source and open standards. But we started talking about open content, open services, and open hardware. So we asked them um, in 2007 to adapt, adopt a much more aggressive, a much stronger policy, um, which we went to them with. And um, that policy is what I, I want to share with you. But I think, um, you know, from a technocrat's perspective, e um, a lot of the open standards and open source work we, we did was directly linked to our own strategy of developing an e-government uh, framework. And I think uh, open standards is quite important, open source and open standards are very important for our own e-government strategies. I don't think I'll go into too much details, I just have 10 minutes, but I think most importantly for us, it gives us free software and software for free. We have quality software that's available at very little expense that we can deploy. So the policy that we went to our cabinet with had five points. It says, we will choose free and open source software, we will migrate to free and open source software, and we will develop in free and open source software. And then in terms of open content, we will use open content licensing for content developed by the South African government. And lastly, not only will we use free and open source and open standards, but we will promote the use of free and open source software in the government of South Africa, uh, in South Africa as a whole. So the statements themselves uh, are the following. The South African government will implement free and open source software unless proprietary software is demonstrated to be significantly superior. The South African government will migrate current proprietary software to free and open source software whenever comparable software exists. All new software developed, by South, developed for or by the South African government will be based on open standards, adherent to FOSS principles, and licensed using a FOSS license where possible. The fourth point, South African government will ensure all government content and content developed using government resources is made open content, unless analysis on specific content shows that proprietary licensing or confidentiality is substantially beneficial. So we're saying the default is that all content should be open, but where for privacy or security reasons, um, open content is not the best option, then we will uh, use a, a different licensing model for that. Uh, and the last point we made is that the South African government will encourage the use of open content and open standards within South Africa. So that was a policy we policy statements we took to cabinet. In uh, February 2007, our cabinet adopted um, those, uh, the new policy. And just to give you an idea, our cabinet is the highest executive authority in the country. At the same time, we realized that uh, a number of issues that were preventing us from implementing the FOSS policy were around the standards. So in October 2007, we went to our minister uh, the Minister of Public Service and Administration, who's responsible for setting um, ICT standards in government with a enhanced uh, or with a new version of a document we call the Minimum Interoperability Operating Handbook for government. Uh, it's called MIOS for short. And uh, I think the main points around the MIOS in version 4.1 is that we actually defined what we mean by open standards. So we went to the minister with a definition of open standards. And uh, the definition that is approved in the MIOS is the following. It should be maintained by a non-commercial organization. That's the first point. Participation in the ongoing development work is based on decision-making processes that are open to all interested parties. Open access. All may access com committee documents, drafts, and completed standards free of cost or for a negligible fee 
difficult word. Um, and I think there we're really just talking about an administration fee, uh, a, a fee for distributing the document um, or, or any other small fee that would be associated with uh, uh, the management of that. It must be possible for everyone to copy, distribute, and use the standard free of cost. The intellectual rights required to implement the standard, example, essential patent claims, are irrevocably available without any royalties attached. There are no reservations regarding the reuse of the standard, and there are multiple implementations of the standard. So that's what we defined as a open standard. But we took in, into account that not all standards um, would meet our ideal definition of an open standard. And in that case, we said that we will look at a standard and we will measure the degree of openness when adopting um, any standards that don't meet uh, that ideal definition. One of the first documents we, or first standards we adopted after having defined what we meant by an open standard was the open document format. And we had a, an, an implementation schedule for the adoption of open document format. We said in March 2008, all government departments must be able to read ODF documents. By September, they should be able to read and write. And by January 2009, it should be the default for exchanging documents between government departments. But, um, you know, we're not alone uh, in terms of our adoption of open standards and in terms of our adoption of uh, open document formats. A, a lot of um, things and a lot of debates have happened around open standards in the recent past. And uh, just recently, we were in Brazil um, at Consigi where we um, formed what we called the South to South Coalition. And there we signed a document called the Consigi Declaration, where countries like ourselves, uh, Ecuador, Venezuela, Paraguay, Cuba, and Brazil came together and signed a document saying that we would look at how we participate in standard setting bodies and that we would make sure that our interests um, as countries would that we would take an active role in, in, in defending our rights in these standard setting processes. Um, in some of our own work, we've, we've held um, workshops around ODF and uh, XML. So there's just some links um, to some of the documents um, that I've spoken about, our policy documents and uh, our minimum interoperability operating standards documents is also available, and I've got a little blog running. Thanks. Like the, the human, human rights perspective of open source, uh, for minorities such as people with disabilities, uh, having access to the source code or having uh, the possibility of having multiple vendors uh, is it's, it's a do or die kind of situation. When when we had, uh, you, when you compare protocols that are open with those that are closed, you, you have the situation where email, for example, uh, it never bothered us when certain companies ignored the needs of people who are blind or people who have other disabilities and made their clients, email clients, inaccessible because there was always other options to, to play with. However, when we had instant messaging that was inaccessible, uh, there was no, no alternative because the protocol was closed. So uh, there is this, this, this other angle, not just intellectual, uh, but very practical and, and has a, a huge impact on professional opportunities, educational opportunities. And we are talking about 600 million people with disabilities across the world. So I just wanted to add that, that perspective. Thank you. I had structural challenges and uh, you know, how you overcame those challenges. Thanks. Cost of getting out of the solutions we currently locked in because of the fact that there aren't um, open standards, 
that uh, you know we've invested a lot in terms of particular products that we can't easily switch. So I think lock-in is uh, one of the biggest challenges we face uh, in terms of implementing the policy. And I think when we started, the single biggest challenge was awareness. Um, government officials just weren't aware of uh, what open standards and open source was. There had to be a, a lot of education. Um, I mean, in fact, we started talking about free software and uh, that just confused uh, a lot of people. So we started talking about open source. But uh, again, now we're starting to change our language and we're starting to speak about free and open source software. So um, I think awareness was the biggest challenge initially, and now it's overcoming issues around lock-in. We'll now, if we take the analogy of what uh, Professor Ghosh has given about, you know, mechanics learning from uh, vehicles, which, uh, you know, uh, automobiles with open hood, whose hood is not locked, so they can learn how to fix a car or, uh, or a vehicle when it is, uh, you know, broken down or, you know, experiment and learn new things. But uh, software is a different thing altogether. Now, as an end user, if I have to uh, fix a software, I need to know a uh, lot of things about programming and you know uh, uh, how to build a software or how to understand you know uh, the the architecture of the uh, software. Now, the cost of free and open source, uh, open source, what we call, is it really free? Accepting the license fee, the total cost of ownership of open source, is it really free? is my uh, question. Could we have two questions from the side of the room? Neither of those, of course, are, would, would probably meet the test of open standards as presented by the panel. But I thought it was particularly telling, and I'm, I'm considering the development nation and the fact that we are moving from e-governance to m-governance, and that mobile phones are going to be where we're going to see quite a bit of development, that TCPIP, the standard that Laura talked about, was actually would not qualify as an open standard under your definitions as well. It was developed by DARPA in a, closed, in a closed environment by a closed number of people. So I'm worried that adopting uh, an open standards policy will restrict the kind of innovation that comes out of a, a Vint Surf with some money or, or for example, a, one of our member companies, Moby Pocket, that came up with the dot .moby format. There's real leapfrog innovation that happens from small individuals that won't qualify as a uh, multi-stakeholder, open standard uh, type development cycle. So it's a little bit more of a comment than a question, but I think we should be cautious before throwing out the, throwing out the whole entire